Most adults have type 2 diabetes, which is a polygenic disorder, meaning we haven't found just one gene that defines it. We all know what we consider to be classic type 2 diabetes. Someone who is perhaps older, heavier, has a metabolic syndrome, and has family members with diabetes. However, looks can be deceiving. In my type 1 clinic in East Los Angeles, I see many Latino individuals with type 1 diabetes who also have the metabolic syndrome and are often misdiagnosed as having type 2 diabetes. When I see these patients, I tend to diagnose them actually based on a positive islet autoantibody level and or their clinical requirement for insulin. I also do a lot of CGM in people with type 2 diabetes, even those on non-insulin therapies. And I see so many different variations in daily glucose profiles, it's often hard to believe that all these people have the same disorder. So I'm sure we're going to find lots and lots of subtypes of type 2 diabetes, even though we haven't defined them yet. Now, a number of people have tried to categorize type 2 diabetes into these subtypes. And in 2018, a group from Sweden published a suggestive classification into five subtypes, which other researchers have found to be more or less true. In 2018, a group from Sweden published a suggested classification into five subtypes of adults with diabetes. And these subtypes have actually seemed to hold true when others have looked into these classifications in their populations. So first, right off the bat, about 6% have what they call severe autoimmune diabetes, or LADA. But the remaining 94% have what we would call classic type 2. The first and most common type is called moderate age-related diabetes. The next type is moderate obesity-related diabetes. And then the two least common types are severe insulin-resistant diabetes and severe insulin-deficient diabetes. And I bet if you think about it, you can remember patients that might fit in each of these different subtypes. And I think of this when I see patients in my clinic. But one of the most important components to this is that the rates of different complications differ based on the subtype of diabetes. So for instance, severe insulin deficient type 2 diabetes has higher rates of retinopathy and severe insulin resistant type 2 diabetes is associated with higher rates of nephropathy. Others are looking at all sorts of ways to define subtypes of type 2 and people are looking hard for the genes that cause type 2 diabetes and I'm sure in the next 5 to 10 years we'll know a lot more. But this is pretty much what we know now. And again, like with type 1 diabetes, what matters most is how we approach the patient clinically. If we feel that someone has type 2 diabetes, I really believe in following the ADA guidelines because basically they're not just looking at glucose. What they're looking at is the risk factors that would lead us to treat those patients with an SGLT2 inhibitor and or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So if somebody that you've diagnosed with type 2 diabetes has high-risk characteristics, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, or is at high risk for cardiovascular disease, use one of these agents or both. And then if a patient is obese or overweight, also consider using agents that help with weight loss. So there's more than one thing we can do to help our patients. It's no longer just glucose. It's looking at all the combined features that are present in an individual. We look at all the features that are present in a patient with diabetes and treat them based on how they're doing at the moment and then how they progress over time. I think that type 2 diabetes has become much, much easier to treat now that we have so many very effective agents for its treatment. When I first started training, all we had was sulfonylurea agents and insulin. We've come a long way from 1995 when metformin was finally approved in the United States. My hope is that we can diagnose people early, diagnose people with prediabetes, and treat them effectively to assure that patients don't develop the complications of diabetes 
But equally importantly, as I hope that we can work to be sure that all people have access to the treatments they need.